Grab your Bibles, if you will. We are in Matthew 15. We're going to pick up in verse 21. This is one of my all-time favorite stories. We will meet an amazing, amazing woman. Amazing woman. Sometimes we find ourselves in a situation where maybe we're just not quite measuring up to what God wants us to be. Or is it just me? Did it get really quiet or are you just feeling sorry for me? Just It's just me. Yeah, well. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Dave and I'm a mess up. Hi, Dave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, but you... <laughs> But we, um, we get into these situations where maybe, um, maybe we're guilty about something. There's some things that we know or seem to be. It's not really true, but it seems like there's something between me and God. Something I said, something I did, maybe a memory. Or maybe we look back on our life. I see this a lot. Um, that there's, there's something going on and it just seems like I'm damaged. Something bad happened maybe years ago. Somebody did something to me. Somebody said something to me. Um, but I was never quite the same after that. And it always made me wonder if I was somehow not good enough to be in God's presence. I know in, in church we would never admit that that's the case. But have you ever felt that way? Because there are times, there are times... And we know the darkness is only too, too happy to whisper in our, in our ear that, oh, well, you know, you, you need to get your act cleaned up before we go to church. So, uh, you know, and, and that turns into a couple of Sundays and a month and a year. And, well, I'd kind of like to go back and be with God, but, you know, I've got all this stuff going on, you know. And this is when we, we start ringing that voice, you know, that verse, Romans 8, 1. If anyone is, in, or excuse me, <laughs> that was the other one. But there is therefore now... No condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. There's always a space. There's always one more chair. There's always one more seat in the boat. There's always one more, one more seat on the bus. It's always welcome. But sometimes it's hard to believe that. But then we find ourselves in a situation where we, we don't have much choice and we have to go engage with God. We have to. There's bad stuff going on and we have to go engage with God. Maybe somebody's sick, or maybe there's a relationship that's blowing up, or maybe something happened financially, but we have to go engage with God because we're in trouble, and we're hoping he's noticed. But if he hasn't noticed, we're going to make sure he noticed today. We're going to meet somebody like that, but we'll also see the amazing compassion, amazing compassion of the Savior. So... And that never disappoints us. Verse 21, Matthew 15. Oh, one more thing, one more thing. We are continuing in our series on building faith. And this is one of those in-between chunks in Matthew where he's going from, he's, have, he's, he's built his harvesters. He's built these men into being harvesters and understanding the harvest is right there and it needs to happen. And he's equipped them with all kinds of experiences, some of them seeing him rejected in spiritual warfare. But then he moves into this next section where he's building faith in them that's going to be stable. It's going to be firmly built on the foundation of God's word and the purpose and uh, personality, the, the personhood of Jesus himself. And so when they grasp that, when they have a good handle on that, Jesus is going to pivot, and it's all about the road to the cross. He's going to reach his goal. So this is in that section part here, and this is part of building faith. Now ba back to 1521. You thought I lost my place, didn't you? <laughs> Jesus went away from there and withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. Have you ever heard of Tyre and Sir Sidon? Have you heard of that place? Do you have any idea where it is? No, yes, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's Tyre and Sidon. It, yeah, side and Tyre, they're right, right there, yeah. Well, you know where Israel is in the eastern end of the Mediterranean, right? Okay, so if you go north of that, there's this area you might have heard of called Phoenicia. 
Do you remember learning phonics in school? <laughs> Blame them. It's their fault. They're the ones that came up with, instead of a pictographic alphabet, they're the ones that came up with letters that represented sounds, and you put those sounds together into coherent words. It was the Phoenicians that came up with this. And the Phoenicians were this amazing seagoing people, and they traveled all over the Mediterranean. They were, for, at, at periods of time, they were fabulously wealthy, and they were very powerful. Um, when Solomon... When Solomon built the temple, you might remember that. When Solomon built the temple, do you know where he bought the cedar and the gold and stuff from? The Phoenicians, Tyre and Sidon. Yes, those are the two big city-states that were really the, the heart and soul of this country. Okay, They didn't have a country in those days like, like we would understand with borders and permeable as some borders may be. But anyway, <laughs> thank you for holding very still. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but Tyre and Sidon was not a really uh, cool place in those days. We look back on it in history and we see what they've contributed, but it was a pretty messy place. And they were part of, they were part of the, that whole band of peoples in that, that area that worshipped the whole gods of the Canaanites. Yeah, that's a little disappointing, isn't it? They were the ones that had Molech, where they sacrificed their children to a fire god, to a demon. These were the ones that had um, Baal worship. And for, um, for a girl to be married, she had to go into town and prostitute herself before she could be married. She had to present an offering to the temple. This is why you talk, you read in the Old Testament, it talks about all the stuff that's going on underneath every oak tree. That's where this came from. So these guys are a part of that. And the Romans, now the, 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 the Phoenicians colonized all across, all across Mediterranean. Have you ever heard of Carthage? Carthaginian Wars, the Punic Wars, all that stuff. You heard of those guys? Okay, Hannibal, those guys. Those are Carthaginians. Guess where they came from? Tyre and Sidon. They, Carthage. <laughs> She's not wrong. Not, not, not wrong at all, yes. But, but moving right along. <laughs> Moving right along, um, it was the Phoenicians from Tyre and Sidon that established that colony on North Africa that became Carthage. And the Romans, looking across the water from the Italian peninsula, looked at this uh, rather powerful group, and uh, one, they were militarily afraid of them. Two, they were given to piracy from time to time. And three... The Romans now, let, let this soak in, the Romans in their paganism thought the Carthaginian paganism was absolutely horrific. <laughs> they were deeply offended at the immorality and the brutality and the viciousness that was encapsulated in that religion. And they thought something needed to be done to stop the bloodshed. The Romans. Yeah. It's frightening, isn't it? The Romans were not exactly gentle people ever in their history. So for them to see this, this was not a good thing going on. And several times in, we can't go to all of them, uh, but several times in Isaiah 23 and Ezekiel 28 and some other chapters, uh, we also see it in Jeremiah, I think 27, I'm not sure. But those chapters are these curses that God is calling down upon these countries, and he's, pr he's predicting in his prophecy they will be destroyed. They will be destroyed because of their, their, their idolatry. They'll be destroyed because of their immorality. They'll be destroyed because of their violence. But these were not nice people. So with that in mind, with the, the Jewish backdrop of the history in mind, let's read that verse again. And see who's going there. Jesus went away from there. He went away from Galilee. And he withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. W what? Why would he go there? Jesus went to some Gentiles. Isn't that interesting? See, Jesus had already made it very clear that 
the pagans would be more responsive to God than Israel had been. Remember he said, if the, he says, it's woe to you because if the miracles had taken place in Tyre and Sidon, remember the rest of it? What's the rest of it? They would have repented in sackcloth and ashes, like thoroughly repented. And so he goes up there. In Romans 15, in Romans 15, it's really interesting because he says, again, Isaiah says, there shall come the root of Jesse and he who arises to rule over the Gentiles. In him shall the Gentiles hope. So not only do we have, not only do we have these, these, these judgments called down upon, upon these, this country, but also we have through, through Jesus, the Gentiles, us, the non the non Jewish guys, they will have hope in him. They will be saved in him. You know, and I've got nothing to brag about. You know, my my ancestors would would uh, strip themselves naked, paint themselves blue, and and run screaming, yelling at the at the Romans. I, I will not demonstrate for. <laughs> um, yeah, but you know, <laughs> not not the kind of thing you brag about over Sunday dinner. You know, this is this is my heritage. Yeah my peeps. And so there's this paganism all over the place, but Jesus takes this short trip. As far as I know, this is the only time he went into a Gentile area. Isn't that curious? Why did he do that? Well, remember we're talking about building faith. What I think we're seeing here is a, a foreshadowing of, of the dispensation of the church. Jesus is, is bringing his guys along with him. I, I want you to see something. We're going to go north. I'm sure they said something to the effect of, why? <laughs> you know, they're not kosher up there. <laughs> remember? And this would be a problem for Peter because remember in, in, uh, in Acts 11 where, the, where the, the sheet is coming down, or Acts, no, Acts chapter 9, where the sheet is coming down and it's full of all these unclean animals. Remember this? And he says, and it says, arise, kill, and eat. And he says, I have never eaten anything unclean. This is a middle-aged man. And he's never eaten anything unclean. This has been a serious kosher man. And they're going up to Tyre and Sidon. Well, you better bring a sack lunch because uh, <laughs> not going to be a lot uh, kosher to eat up there. But this is interesting. Jesus takes this, these guys up there to have a peek at these people. But have you noticed how intense the opposition to Christ has already been? And we've already seen back a couple chapters before where the, the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees have already rejected him theologically. They keep testing him to make it worse. They're trying to embarrass him now. It's not just that they're finding out that he disagrees with them. and that They've been doing some things that are terribly mistaken. But now they're beginning to, to set out feelers that how can we destroy him? So they've rejected him. And he goes back to visit his hometown. Remember that? And they couldn't get over the fact that he was just one of the local boys. And who do you think you are? Getting a little big for your britches here. So, you know, we don't want to listen to your, your wisdom or your revelation from God. We don't want to hear from you. So just be quiet. So he's been rejected at just about every level. And so he takes a trip up to the Gentiles. It's making a little more sense. And this is a foreshadowing then of this of this dispensation of, of the church. The Gentiles will be, will be hoping in Christ. And so he goes up there, and he takes these guys with him. He says, it's not going to be very long before, uh, well, it's going to be several years, but, but they're going to find out the Gentiles are coming to Christ after the resurrection, you know, and the, the persecution that started with Stephen, and these guys scatter all over the place, and they go up to Antioch, and all these Gentiles are getting saved. It's non-Jewish people coming to Christ in droves. And so they send Barnabas up there. You know the story, right? You've you read Acts, right? Yeah, okay. And so, so they, they're, they're, they're going up there to, to see what's going on, and, and, and Barnabas figures, out, hey, you know, I, I, need to, I need to go find Paul because he's, he's the guy. We need to teach all these people. We need somebody who really knows their stuff, so they go get Paul. And they're just amazed at all of these Gentiles are believing in Christ. They didn't have a box for this. But maybe they had a little envelope, maybe, 
a little envelope that they could put this in because Jesus had taken up there to see this. So he's building a receptivity in them. This is part of building faith, isn't it? To be open to the things that God is going to, going to do in your life, however outside of your normal box it may be. Have you noticed that God will take you in places you never expected? Yeah. I was planning a career in the military. Then I was going to be a pastor. Then I turned into a therapist. How did that happen? <laughs> so, anyway. Oh, wait, I'm still a pastor. But anyway, move on. Okay. So, so he goes to the pagans, and listen to the pattern here. He goes to the Gentiles, and the only interaction we have in that neighborhood is with this one woman, right? So he goes, he helps this woman and her daughter, and he comes back. And he returns his attention to the Jews. Does that sound like a familiar pattern to you? See, this, this seems to me he's giving them a little picture of this dispensation of where we are today, which is a much grander scale than... But he could have gone and he could have helped... He could have helped lots of men. He could have helped lots of people. But he just picked out this one special woman and her daughter, her offspring, and rescued them both. <coughs> what a savior. 22. And a Canaanite woman from that region came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and imploring him, saying, Send her away, because she keeps shouting at us. <laughs> Maybe, you know, the, the little editing marks here. New American Standard has the, the Syrophoenician woman. Did some of you actually try to pronounce that word? Is that, was that a hard one? And wh why is she called that? Well, in Mark, she's called a Syrophoenician woman. Why, where does that come from? Well, the whole region the Romans called Syria, that whole big region. To them, they just labeled that Syria, okay? And that name still hangs on to that one country that's there, but it's politically a very different thing. So anyway, the Romans called that whole thing Syria, and so she is nationally, she is a Phoenician, right? So you just kind of hyphenate it, you know? Jewish American, African American, Mexican American, it's just kind of hyphenated that way, okay? So that's who she is. So she's really Phoenician, but she lives in this political entity known as Syria under the Romans. So Matthew and Mark make it very clear, though. Ma Matthew calls her a Canaanite woman, probably because of her cultural background. And Mark calls her the Syrophoenician. So they're making it really clear she's not Jewish. So she came from the wrong side of the tracks. This was not someone that would be welcome, and she's got some strikes against her. Think about that. First of all, these are, these are Jewish men, right? And, and first of all, she's not Jewish. So that means that culturally, they don't want to talk to her. I don't think that's very polite, but that's where they were at, okay? They don't want to talk to her. What's the next strike against her? She's a woman, yes, yes. And she's Phoenician. Tyre and Sidon, and we've got verses that we could show you that those, those countries were cursed by God and going to be destroyed. Whoa. They'd already experienced some of that under the Babylonians, and here it was under the Romans again. So she's got at least three strikes, and usually three strikes, you're out. But she shows up, this Canaanite woman from that region, so they've really anchored that she's there, and Jesus calls out to her, Lord, son of David, that my daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. Can you hear her heart? This is a real person. Sometimes we talk about Bible characters as if they're some kind of cartoon. This is a real person. She had a name. She had a face. She had friends. She had family. She has a daughter. We don't know where the man in her life is. Maybe he's, maybe he's not. I don't know. But when she'd walk through the market, you could recognize who she was by the way her clothes fit on her, by the way she, she walked, her gait, her mannerisms. Just like one of us. We can do that with each other, right? 
We can pick each other out at a distance because we know those things about it, about each other. She's one of these, she's just a person like us. She's one of those, one of us. But she's from the wrong side of the tracks, but she's a mom and her daughter is suffering terribly. We don't know what this demon is doing to her, but in a culture that is steeped in some of the most vile paganism that was known, She's scared to death what's going on with her daughter. And she's come to God to ask for help. Now, she has no right to ask anything from this Jewish rabbi teacher guy, does she? She's not a part of the covenant. She doesn't, probably doesn't even really speak the language. And so here she is, non-Jewish, a woman, pagan, maybe, we'll see, and a Phoenician. She has no right to ask anything from Jesus. But she's there. Listen to what she calls him. Did you notice that? Now, this is not, a, this is not someone who went to yeshiva school when she was a girl. This, right? This is, this is, and she gets it absolutely right. How did she do this? This woman's paying attention. Now, we don't know her whole story here. Obviously, we don't know her story. But she is not Jewish, and they made it very clear she's not. But she says, Lord, son of David. She knows exactly who Jesus is. She's addressing Jesus as the son of David, which means what? He is the heir to David's throne. And as the heir to David's throne, the prophecies would say then that this is who? The Messiah. This is the one that had been promised for centuries. Since, since Adam and Eve fell, it's been promised that this Messiah would come and he would crush Satan's head and set everything right. And so she cries out to him, Lord, son of David, this is the Messiah. But then Jesus says this curious thing. Verse 23, but he didn't answer her a word. Now, doesn't that kind of stick out funny when you look at it? If we don't just blah, blah, you know how sometimes we'll, we'll, we'll read a story and we'll just kind of monotone, walk through it. Don't do this this time. Read through this if you're there and you're listening to Matthew. You know, you got, you got tickets to Matthew. M Matthew speaks tonight. You know, you're sitting in the audience. You're listening to Matthew's talk. How is he going to talk to you? And she's crying out, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. Help me. But he didn't answer her a word. The DLT inserts, huh. <laughs> because Jesus is very responsive to people, right? But this time, he just he doesn't answer her at all. Apparently, she can see him. And this goes on for a while. So long that even Matthew, who was one of the disciples, don't miss that little deal, detail, and his disciples came and implored him, saying, send her away because she keeps shouting at us. This woman is a pest. She's driving us nuts. Maybe she didn't have a very pretty voice. I don't know. I can't imagine that. After you get to know her in this story a little bit, but, you know, <laughs> maybe it was a little nasally or maybe it was an ugly accent. I don't know. But whatever it was, it's getting on these guys' nerves. You know, fingernails on a chalkboard, and they've had enough. Send her away. You know, if you're not going to talk to her, you're not going to do anything about it, at least, at least give her, get rid of her because it's, it's driving us all crazy. So why didn't he answer her? Would you like to know why he didn't answer her? Me too, because I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But Matthew does make it sound like it's a strange thing that he didn't answer. Maybe Jesus was answering for his disciples to, to pray for her. I mean, they kind of did, didn't they? It's not a very nice prayer. We'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> Maybe he's letting her persistent prayer to, to him um, so that it's heard by the 12, by those important disciples following this man who everybody seems to be figuring out is really the Messiah. Maybe sh Jesus is letting her be heard by her neighbors. I don't know. But in any case... She's not going to give up. She's not going to give up. And so why would, would, would you mothers give up 
There's somebody there that you know can help your kid. And your kid could die from this. Your kid is going to be destroyed by this, scarred emotionally perhaps for life by this, and you have no idea how to peel this evil spirit off of her. And it seems to enjoy harming her. How would you react? You know, if it was some kind of a doctor or a surgeon, you'd be like sitting in his doorway. You're not going in unless you fix my kid. Don't make me hurt you. Right? So she's not going to give up. And the disciples had enough, and they say, send her away. It's a dumb prayer. Isn't that a dumb prayer? Have you ever prayed a dumb prayer? Thanks for being honest. It is church. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dumb prayer. But, you know, Paul talks about that, doesn't he? In Romans 8, he says that we don't know how to pray as we should, but the prayer, the, the Holy Spirit will pray for us with groanings too deep for words. So does, it, does this mean that it's okay to pray dumb things? I'm not sure. I'm not sure on that one. But we do know that there's a lot of things we don't pray well. We don't understand what we're supposed to pray for. We don't know how to pray. We don't know how to address God. How do we address a God we can't even wrap our minds around in his, his grandeur and his holiness and his amazing love, his spectacular wisdom? How do we approach him and tell him what's going on and what we need? That's presumptuous at best, doesn't it seem? But, but these guys pray this dumb prayer. Send her away. They think that's what's best. And it's not until then that Jesus begins to speak to her. Did you pick up on that? So Jesus answered her with a puzzle. He doesn't rebuke her, does he? He says some things that to our ears seem really harsh, but he doesn't rebuke her. So he answers their prayer on <laughs> the prayer of the disciples on behalf of this woman in trouble. I want you to notice something. Would you say that this woman believes in Jesus? Yeah. Yeah, maybe she doesn't know all the answers. But she knows something. Lord, son of David, this is not coming out of a vacuum. She knows something. We don't know what, but she knows something. And so she's believing. I want you to pick up on something here. In Psalm 19, verse 9... This is one of those beautiful psalms. If you're not familiar with Psalm 19, spend some time just meditating in that one. Just roll it over in your head. Just roll it over your head. We're going to pick up verse 9 here. Look at this. And let this soak in. The fear of the Lord is what? Clean. I thought this was an unclean woman. Right? She doesn't eat kosher. She, uh, she's a Gentile, she's a woman, she's a, a Philistine, or excuse me, a Phoenician. She's under, uh, her nation is under judgment from God. They're under the domination of the Romans. I mean, there's nothing good going on here. But the fear of the Lord is clean. What's the next phrase? En enduring, uh, hold on, enduring forever. It's clean, enduring forever. Now, when you, f when you believe in, in Christ, you get a life that has no beginning and has no end. Why is it we're able to be in his presence? Because faith in God allows him to pay for our sin and make us clean. Follow me on this? And then we step into this life, his life, it's given to us that has no beginning and has no end, that was never created, will never come to an end, has always existed, always will exist. Astounding. We step into that relationship through Christ. The fear of the Lord is clean. Clean in what sense? Well, it's fear. Is, it's, it's clean. It's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what does it do to people? Remember, Jewish people are very practical and very pragmatic. And this, this is what this psalm is all about, being very pragmatic, very, very practical. And this fear of the Lord isn't just clean in itself in some abstract concept. It cleanses you. It 
blows away whatever has contaminated you and gives you this life that has no beginning and has no end. Wow. Then he says, the judgments of the Lord are true. What's the next phrase? They are righteous altogether. Remember what righteous means? It's not doing the right things and not doing the wrong things. Righteousness is being right and holy with God and reaching out to others in what? Love and mercy. Here's this woman that comes to Jesus. She believes in him. She knows he can help. She knows who he is. How much faith is enough? That's plenty. And I believe she's clean. She's alive. Praise God. This woman is magnificent. Maybe she shouts a lot and it gets on your nerves. But this woman is, this woman is magnificent. She is not going to let go. And Jesus demonstrates that. It looks to our eyes that maybe he's going to be kind of rude to her. And maybe he is. But let's look at why. Let's look at why he's doing that. So the 12 then, the 12 then see Jesus, back to, back to Matthew. The 12 then see Jesus affectionately praise her. And, and, the, and answers her prayer. And later, later, I wonder when they began to see Gentiles coming to Christ, if this woman came to mind, hey, we've seen this before. We saw this once before. Remember that crazy lady that was getting on our nerves? And Jesus healed her daughter. Remember that? Oh, yeah. Well, let's multiply that by tens of thousands in Antioch. All right, seen this before. Isn't that a big boost to faith, to being able to trust God when you've seen him do things before? Okay? So he's building faith. Anyway, so the 12 would understand later that God loves Gentiles, and he will hear their prayer, and they will be saved. But remember, after the resurrection, there was a whole bunch of stuff that happens, and Paul, who, who did Paul gen basically go to? The Gentiles, right? So pretty much, as the compass goes, he went west, Right? And, and the other disciples took off too. Once the persecution started, they all had to move out because Jesus had told them that they will go out and they were still clumped up in Jerusalem. So the persecution started and out they went. And this other guy named Thomas, you remember Thomas? We gave Thomas a hard time about being doubting Thomas. But he's also the one that when Jesus was going to go back to Jerusalem and Peter was trying to say, if you go back there, they're going to kill you. Thomas is the one that said, let's go with him and die with him. Not the cheeriest phrase, but, <laughs> but here's a guy that's loyal. You know where he went? India. Exactly right. And we're not sure whether it was Thomas or one of the other disciples that went into China. We know that as, as they were moving, as the disciples... This, um, persecution started they came out of jerusalem they crossed the roman frontier and they went into parthia we've talked about that a little bit before does that sound familiar to you guys so they go into parthia and they follow the fertile crescent and they get up to the to the northeast corner northeast corner of the fertile crescent and and what country is there assyria remember the assyrians the assyrians although god destroyed them <laughs> he preserved a handful of them, and they're living up in the Taurus Mountains. They still live there. It's in Iraq. And those people coming out of Jerusalem came because they speak Aramaic, which is what the Assyrians speak. They led them to Christ, and the Assyrians are still Assyrians, brothers and sisters. They were aggressive, strong, hard-minded, hard hard, you know, tough-minded people. And so they basically took the bit in their teeth and, well, this gospel thing's important. We need to go places with this. And so being Assyrians, they took off and they went into China. And when Genghis Khan was ruling in, or not Genghis Khan, but the great Khan was ruling in China, and Marco Polo left Italy and he went to, he found Assyrian missionaries in China. Yeah. They were impressed by that. There's still believers in Assyria. Isn't that something? 
all those terrible people in Isaiah and Jeremiah, and yet these are brothers and sisters. <laughs> God seems to have a soft spot for Gentiles. Good news, huh? <laughs> So Paul goes west, Thomas goes east, and who knows? Others went north, some went, some went into Egypt. So it, it was, uh, It's amazing what happened. And so we've seen this before. We've seen, we've seen this woman get saved, and as it, as it, as it spreads out to the gospel later, um, this was not a new thing that they were actually seeing. God will often expose you to things so you've seen it before, and then when you really need to rely on it, and it happens again, you're prepared for it. He will build your faith this way. So it's not always just, well, here we go again. No, maybe here we go again because God's been exposing this to me and I need to be prepared for this. I need to, I need to anticipate he's going to do something through me with this situation. So anyway, verse 24. But he answered her and said, I was, I hear the gentleness in his voice. This is not a rebuke. There's tenderness here. But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Remember what Paul says in Romans? We're going through Romans, right? Romans chapter 1, it says, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, right? So it's to the Jew first. Jesus came to give Israel a chance to believe. They rejected him, and then he, he turns, he sends the Holy Spirit and, and turns to the Gentiles. That's how history is played out. But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He's ba basically saying, uh, it might be nice, this is the, the DLT inserting again, it would be nice to help you with your problem, but I have been sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Why did he go to that, that line of reasoning? Why would he go there? Doesn't it seem like an odd thing? He could have said, sorry lady, I can't help you. I'm here for the Jewish people. He could have said that. Well, why on earth is the entire inside in then? What are you doing there? I mean, th this raises more questions. Why, why, why did you say this to her? Don't lose that word lost sheep. Don't lose that. This is where it gets good. But she came. <laughs> this, is, this lady is not somebody who's going to back off. <laughs> She's, you know, I'm well, I'm, I'm only here for the lost sheep. Yeah, he's only here. For, I'm only here for the lost sheep. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> and up she comes. <laughs> maybe, maybe she's not a lost sheep. Maybe she's more like a lion because here she comes, right? <laughs> but she came and began to bow down before him. But don't miss her humility. Saying, what? Lord, help me. If your heart doesn't break for her, you need a new heart. So Jesus didn't simply send her away, even if that's what the disciples were asking of him. Jesus saw her heart, and there was something really attractive about her heart. There's more here to her than a troubled, shouting woman. And Jesus' precise, precise conversation with her reveals this. And his clever wording draws out some of her depth. I want you to look at Romans chapter 4. I'm going to spoil some of the stuff I'm going to look at in a couple of weeks in, in Romans, but I don't care. This is really cool. Romans chapter 4, verse 9. Got it? Isn't that a pretty sound when people are just floating through the pages in their Bible? You know, you guys that just have pictures of the Bible, I kind of feel sorry for you. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, picking up with verse 9, he's been talking about Abraham. And he says in verse 1, he says, What then should we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not for God. But for what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. Now, drop down to verse 9. Is this blessing then, this crediting of righteousness, is this blessing then upon the circumcised or upon the uncircumcised also? 
Good question. For we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Oh, remember your history. Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. He received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them. Translation, she's in. She's in. Because this woman has the very same faith that Abraham had. No difference. Maybe not as well educated, maybe not as, as tidy. But there's no question that her heart belongs to God and she is there begging him for help. And isn't it interesting that that's how Jesus started this conversation with her? And he, and he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's not a rebuke, is it? He's including her, but he's not done yet. He's not done yet. So was she Jewish? No, but she's still of the faith of Abraham, holding that faith that makes him the father of us all who believe. Notice, too, that she knows and understands that Jesus is the Messiah. She's aware of his presence in Judea. I'm not sure how that happened. Maybe because all the people are getting healed or the miracles. I don't know. But word travels fast in small town. So she's aware of him. And she says, Lord, help me. The anguished cry of a desperate mother over her child. And any of us would beg for mercy for our child. And many of us have. And this is, this is the cry of one who has faith has no faith, I should say. This is one who has no faith in the traditional gods of the Phoenicians. 26. And he answered and said, Answered what? Help me. And he answered and said, I still hear his voice. It's kind. It's soft. She's right there. She's bowing down in front of him. It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Wow, that's harsh. But she said, yes, Lord. But even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. <laughs> Don't you just love her? <laughs> she is not going to give up. Her faith is tenacious. She means business with, with God. She knows he can help, and she's not going to let go. When you pray, do you mean business with God? Do you hold on like that? Do you? Remember there was this guy and he wrestled with an angel all night? Yeah? And he wouldn't let go until the angel blessed him, even though he'd lost. He totally lost. <laughs> but I'm not going to let go <laughs> until you bless me. And so he blessed him. Jesus answered her and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she said, yes, Lord. Can you hear her muffled voice down on the ground with her face to his feet? Yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Jesus pushes her even harder here. Children's bread. You're asking me to give the blessings of the children of the promise that came to Abraham. You're asking me to give the blessings of the children of the promise to a stranger. Is that a good thing? He brings up this ugly word, dogs. Now, in that culture, I love dogs. Do you have a dog? 
Well, some of us have a dog, yeah. <laughs> and some of us have a dog named Angel, which I think is an absolutely poetic, perfect name for that dog. Not just because it's a wonderfully behaved, wonderful dog, but, you know, to guide you through life. Name your dog Angel. That's perfect. And, uh, you know, my dog Memphis, you know, I could go on about my dog Memphis. That was the best dog in the world. Um, I, I don't care about your dog. I, th my dog was the best dog in the world. No bias, just fact, okay? But they were unclean scavengers. They were unclean. They were unholy things. And a dog, then, is someone that they called people who are separated from the covenant of Abraham. It is a bigoted term. But she wears it, doesn't she? She doesn't push back. She just says, yes, Lord. She is well aware of her status as a Phoenician Gentile. Does that mean Jesus was a bigot? No. That's unthinkable. If that were the case, why is he in Phoenicia? Why is he there? There'd be nothing there for him. But we also have to keep in mind, people in those days were not as thin-skinned as they are now. <laughs> right? She didn't, she didn't burst into tears and have to go find a safe room with a blanket and a puppy and, and some hot chocolate. Because she's got bigger things, bigger fish to fry, and she's holding on to Jesus. Now, I want you to notice something here. Look, look hard at that verse. Do you see that what she says, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs that fall from their masters. masters. Where's the apostrophe? After the yes, what does that make it? Plural. To mispronounce it, their masters is. What is she saying? That I have no part of Israel, and Israel, because of their God and the promises that they have, they are masters of the world. She knows this. This is why she wears this label of a dog. She's accepting, I know, I'm unclean, I don't fit in, I'm not, I'm not part of this crowd, I'm from the wrong. Wrong side of the tracks. I have no right to ask anything from God. I'm unclean, I'm uneducated, I haven't gone to the right churches, I don't come from the right family. But she's asking anyway. In chapter 6 of Isaiah, we see a similar story. Remember that story? This is the chapter where Isaiah puts forth his pedigree. This is, these are my qualifications to be a prophet and, and to speak these things in this book that God has given me to give to you. And he's, he's Jewish. He's from the tribe of Judah. And he tells, he, re, he relates that he was, um, he was out there and suddenly he has this vision where he is in the temple and he has no business being inside that part of the temple because he's there in the presence of God. So he's somehow transported into the Holy of Holies. What tribe is he from? He's not a Levite. He has no business being there. And he says, I am a man of unclean lips. What does that mean? My heart is dirty. I am unholy. I have no business being in front of the holy God. And I, and I don't have a pedigree. I come from a people of unclean lips. We're, we're dirty right down to our hearts because out of the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? And so what, is, what does this angel do? Grab, flies instantly he's over to the, 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 the altar where the sin offering is burned and he picks up a coal with tongs. He doesn't touch it. You can figure that one out later. Doesn't touch it. He comes over and he touches Isaiah on the lips. Psst. You are cleansed. No sooner did Isaiah say, I have no right to be in front of God, than God gives him the right to be in front of God. Welcomes him, cleanses him, makes him completely. You know that, that Christmas song, and fit us for heaven? You know that, right? Away in a manger and fit us for heaven? That's why we say fit us, tailor us, shape us, change us, transform us. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. We hold this treasure in earthen vessels. 
So this is what he's doing. And so he's drawing her out. Is he being cruel to her? No, he knows what he's going to do. But he draws her out so that everybody around her can see what he will do for her. And so she agrees with him. She doesn't push back. Yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed from the crumbs. I'm not asking for all of what the children deserve, their blessings, but this, that is so vast, I can have a crumb. Let me pick up a crumb. I'm just after a crumb. That's all I need. And a crumb for her would be a bounty, wouldn't it? <laughs> and Jesus said to her, O woman, your faith is great. Can you still hear his voice? It hasn't changed much. O woman, your faith is great. It should be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. Boom! See, this is the beginning of the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham that through him all the families of the earth would be blessed. And this child was healed at once. But behold the compassion of the Savior. Is this the only time that Jesus drew somebody out? No. Remember the woman with the hemorrhage? Remember that? I can't tell the whole story, although I'd love to, because I love that story. There's another woman that's fabulous. She's, she's, she's been bleeding in a very unattractive way for a long time, 12 years. Years she spent everything she has. She has no right to come before Jesus and ask for anything. So she sneaks it in. <laughs> Somehow she gets down on the ground, reaches through all the legs of the disciples and whoever came with Jairus. Remember, they're on their way to Jairus' house. Gets a hold of the tassel on, the, on his robe. <laughs> Because all the Jewish men had tassels, and those tassels meant that they were in submission to Moses and, the, and God. And so she reaches over and touches that, and all of a sudden, she's healed. Boom. Should have made a sound like that, you know? <laughs> and what did Jesus do? He stops, and everybody bumps into him, you know, because Peter's right there all the time. <laughs> then he turns around, and he says, who touched me? Peter, ever the vocal one for the entire group, says, Lord, everybody's touching you. What do you mean, who's touching you? Somebody touched me, I felt power go out. Lord, we're going to Jairus' house. We're walking, we're, we're walking. No. Somebody touched me. And they all start denying it. You know, he's, I, I, think he's, I think he's looking right at her. Looking right at her. And they were going, no, 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 was it me? Was it, no, I didn't touch, no, I didn't touch. That, the disciples were, oh, none of us touched you. Oh, I thought everybody's touching. Oh, none of us, none of us. So now nobody's touching. <laughs> Just a minute ago, they were all touching. And that would have been customary. You know, reach out and kind of touch and bless and get the blessing back. You know, that would be customary. They would do that. But now nobody is. And he looks right at her. And finally she cracks. Wasn't that harsh? But look what she had done. She'd been invisible all this time. She'd been hiding. She was supposed to tell everybody, unclean, unclean, because of her bleeding. But this time, she gets caught. So she touches him. Nobody saw it. This lady has some skills. She gets her hand back, even while shocked of being healed, and she vanishes back into that crowd like smoke. Who touched me? It must be the gaze on his face. Was it you? It was you, wasn't it? <laughs> and she cracks. And she throws herself in front of him and tells the whole ugly, sad, sordid medical story. And he says, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. What did he just do? He gave her life back to her. 
because she had been hiding for so long, even though she was healed, she went right back to hiding. In that respect, he saved her twice. Behold the mercy of God. Anyway, uh, I lied. I told the whole story. <laughs> Think about Jairus, the leper, the blind, the lame, some centurion slave, Cornelius, chapter 10, Acts, and you and me, lost in our sin. Lord, help me. I don't even know what I'm asking for. Lord, help me. What attracted Jesus to this woman? Well, by now it's obvious. The beautifulness, the, the, the glory, subtle as it was, of her, of her simple faith. G. Campbell Morgan in his commentary said, uh, in our relation to Jesus Christ as his messengers and workers, let us look for faith in unexpected places. Let us not keep out of Tyre and Sidon because there are no good people there. There is a freshness of faith everywhere waiting to surprise us if we will only venture to cross the line. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for having Matthew describe this beautiful woman to us, but showing us more of your stunning and beautiful compassion upon her, dis her, her distress and her problem and saving that child and reminding us that it wasn't just her you were coming after. You came after us all. You opened the door, flung open the doors, tore down the, the veil and allowed us to walk into your presence. Those of us, none of us, on the right side of the tracks. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.